let's get started. I would like to actually start with a video. And um, here goes. It all begins from a single origin. A unique point in space and time. This is the spark of innovation that fuels your most amazing breakthroughs. It's a passion for discovery that unveiled the genesis of all that exists in the universe. Today, the power of AI helps computers achieve superhuman capabilities in image recognition and let scientists save our most precious resources by analyzing in one month what used to take 10 years. Everyday devices translate even the most complex languages from voice into text and images into words. Xavier is now present. Helping the visually impaired recognize an old friend or letting a blind woman read to her child for the first time. Autonomous vehicles give us the freedom to reimagine our city streets and travel where there are no streets at all to help the lost find their way home. We see robots teach themselves to perform simple tasks. We even watch in awe as they take their first steps. And today, a 2,500-year-old game meets its match as a computer competes with one of the greatest human champions of all time and wins. This is the collective imagination, fueled by forward-looking technologies and the beginning of your most amazing discoveries yet to come. All right, so that was a quick preview. Now, let's start with what is the opportunity and um, for people in this um, industry or in this area of data science. Um, I will take help of NASCOM study, which is available, in fact, openly available. So according to one of the studies, NASCOM predicted that in 2014, you know, the software in the analytics software and services market was about USD 1 billion. And by 2020, it would become 3 billion. So that is more from the industry or the or the market size uh, perspective, which kind of also needs people in this area. So it also has a study about the demand supply gap. And on the same lines, the gap was about 62,000 in 2018, which is last year. And it is predicted that it will become 1,40,000 or 140,000 by the next two years, that is 2021. Again, this is a NASCOM report. And we often see this in the newspapers as well. Here are a few examples. This is some of it within India and some of it globally. So some on the right hand side, if you see, it's not just in India, it's a global phenomenon. There is a demand for uh, uh, people or skills in this area and therefore, there is demand for this information or this knowledge as Pradeep mentioned to be shared and spread across uh, the community. AI particularly, so data science, when we say data science AI is kind of a part of that. Um, so there, here are some numbers. Let me just move this in case this is blocking you, your view. Uh, so this is again a study uh, around the AI skills and this was actually done by um, the, the task force, AI task force. And if you see here, there are the percentage of AI jobs, percentage of the total jobs, which, which actually uh, are related to AI is uh, in this uh, range, 37% in Bangalore, 23% in 
Delhi and so on and so forth. But what is more important is it is going to create AI itself is going to create 2.3 million jobs globally, of course. And of course, and a, a large part of it will be required in India as well. And then there are a few numbers around the compensation with respect to experience and so on and so forth. So net net AI and in general data science, data science is a, a very sought after, hugely sought after skill. And it makes sense to probably um, build a career in this uh, in this space. So you must have heard this term data scientist already. This is pretty popular, the most sought after role or job. So why do we need data scientists? And when we talk about uh, analytics in general, um, by and large, you know, data scientist role is a very broad uh, role and everything under data science comes under this. So why do we need data scientists? You must have, in fact, some of you must have already seen this kind of a, a image earlier because this is pretty much every year I'm seeing this for the last uh, maybe five, six, seven, eight years. Uh, this comes up at, uh, every year. This is about the kind of amount of data that we are generating over the web. And this is about the data that gets generated on the internet in just one minute. So for example, there are 2.1 million snaps created, 41.6 million messages sent on WhatsApp, 390,000 apps are downloaded from Google Play and uh, Apple App Store. 3.8 million searches on Google, and so on and so forth, right? So the, a large amount of data is being generated. That's the point around data growth. Now, in addition to that, uh, there is uh, another study by insightbigdata.com, which says that the amount of data, which is probably around 4.4 zettabytes, so now we are no longer talking about terabytes. We are talking about zettabytes. And this would go to 44 zettabytes in the next year or two. So you can imagine the amount of data that is being generated. Large part of it on the cloud, <coughs> some of it on the on-premise and so on and so forth. So there has to be someone who needs to process this information, work on this data. And so data is, when we say data, it is the raw data, which is not just having this data is not sufficient. So what happens if we just have data and we don't derive insights out of it? So there are a couple of interesting quotes that I wanted to put here. So one says, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess. In other words, if you don't interpret the data properly, if you don't get the proper insights out of it, you can, there's a danger that it will be misinterpreted and you can look at the data in the way you like it or you want it, rather than truly right, finding the right insights out of it. There's another saying by Andrew Lang, by the way, he's a poet, he's not a data scientist, okay? So this says, an unsophisticated forecaster uses statistics as a drunken man uses lamp force for support rather than illumination very interesting okay so what it says is you need people with expertise and they, they these are the people known as data scientists to actually take this large amounts of data and process it so you need some expertise to do that and that is what data scientists do and to get the correct insights so that organizations can take the, the right decisions and succeed. Because today, pretty much every organization has a large amount of data. You must have already heard that data is gold and things like that, or data is the new oil and things like that, right? So whether they like it or not, they are ending up generating a large amount of data. And simply by having the data, that's not sufficient. That is not going to help them unless they take, they, they get insights or derive insights out of them by processing and analyzing this data. And that is where data scientists come in. So now what is data science? The Wikipedia definition of data science 
says that it is a multidisciplinary field that uses scientific methods, processes, algorithms, and systems to extract knowledge and insights from the structured and unstructured data. So that's very important to know, structured and unstructured. Right. So data is nothing but it, it's just raw information. So there's very little that usually we will not be able to do much about it unless you derive insights or extract knowledge from it. And that is what data scientists do. So this is broadly what are the elements of data science. I'm sorry for the typo there, elements of data science. So we typically start by capturing the data and there are multiple ways. There are, um, as you have seen the, in the previous image, there, there is social media data that is already getting generated. Uh, then there are enterprise, in the next slide I'll show you, there is enterprise data. So uh, which like they have transactional, every organization has transactional systems like ERP, CRM and so on. So that is used for capturing the data and then we need to then store and clean the data because sometimes when you get the data let's say from social media or from the web and things like that there is a lot of additional stuff that comes in which you don't need like the tags and things like that uh, so that is what is data cleaning and storage by the way we spend a lot of time in overall data science People usually get um, carried away by the machine learning, deep learning part of it. But before even you arrive there, you need to do spend a lot of time in preparing the data itself. And uh, on a project of um, AI or ML project, we end up invariably end up spending about 60 to 70 percent, if not more, on these earlier parts, which is cleaning and preparing the data. So that's a large, uh, that's a huge effort and there is a lot of expertise required, skills required there as well. Then you ex do the data exploration, right? And sometimes it's known as EDA or exploratory data analysis, uh, which is basically taking a, in a way a cursory look at the data. You don't get any insights here, but just see whether, you know, what's the kind of structure there in the data, if it is structured data or what are the elements, what is the content, and so on before you and you can prepare it and so on and you can also do some visualization at this stage or after doing that after doing the exploration exploratory analysis you can probably put it in some format and then you can visualize using some tools and once you have the data in a proper format that is when you will be able to perform machine learning or deep learning ml stands for machine learning and dl stands for deep learning some of you are new to this I will tell you what exactly that is in a couple of slides from now. And finally, we take the decision that we need. The enterprises take the decision or the decision also can be automated if it is in, the, in an application. Let's say the application could be chatbot. So the chatbot can probably take a decision based on the processing of this information or it could be a robot. So there are different applications uh, end applications. Or of course, it can also be as simple as a as a report or a chart, or some human beings taking a decision based on the insights that they derive out of it. And in order to do this, we utilize or use a lot of tools that are available. And the good news is today, a lot of these tools are open source, which means that it's very easy for people like you and me to learn and do self learning. For example, R is a tool, fantastic statistical or even machine learning tool that can be used for performing a lot of statistical analysis and also machine learning. And it is an open source tool, R and R Studio. So anybody can download it and play around and learn it. Unlike maybe 10, 15 years back when, when I entered the IT industry, a lot of it was proprietary software, so you couldn't by yourself learn a lot similarly python programming today by the way python has become like the the gold standard for programming language from a programming language perspective a lot of data science 
activities are done using Python. So if some of you are new and are looking at learning a programming language, my recommendation is to pick up Python. Very easy to learn, but very powerful and very popular. Then you have other tools and platforms like Hadoop, you have Spark and so on. Each of these, they are all pretty much open source except for Tableau, which is a proprietary tool, but it is a fantastic tool. And by the way, in case you have not heard, this got acquired by salesforce.com. But most of the other tools that are mentioned here are all open source, which means it is free. Any one of you can go and download and play around with it. Okay, so a variety of these tools are used in performing all these data science activities. We will take a look at some of them as we go along. Let me just also keep my chat window open in case there are any questions. So Pradeep, if there are any questions, you can, uh, it, would, it would be nice if you can send it across in the chat because I'm not able to see the question tab. All right, so I'll keep moving. And if I get any questions, I will uh, pick them up. As of now, I don't see um, any questions. So talking about data capture, uh, let me just minimize this in case it is coming in your way. Yeah. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of sources of data, depending on which industry or um, you know, what, what is the uh, domain. There are different sources of uh, data capture. For example, airline industry, every aircraft generates a lot of data from all the sensors and so on. Um, in general, all uh, organizations or enterprises have what is known as an ERP system, enterprise resource planning. And these systems have been there for several years, so they will be generating a lot of data, especially these are, if there are some global organizations, they, they would be storing global data. They may be having offices all over the world and they will have this um, data coming from all over the world. And typically they will also have other systems. So they will be like, for example, a CRM system, which is customer relationship management, or uh, you may have a PLM, or which is uh, product lifecycle management and so on, right? And, and um, sometimes you may have a dedicated, um, instead of having CRM, you may have a dedicated marketing application. And each of these typically will have their own database and, and you need to kind of merge them and, and then uh, derive insights out of that. Even today, a lot of these uh, um, enterprises have these data in, in silos, so they are separated out. So as a part of big data, I will in the next slide, I will show you, you can actually bring all of this into one place and then have what is known as a 360 degree view. Then all of you must be familiar with CCTV cameras. Everywhere today we have CCTV cameras. So these cameras generate a lot of data and there are a lot of insights that can be derived out of it. There are a lot of, applications that are developed which will take the video input and then give you uh, immediate um, you know, action based on a real-time basis. Facial recognition is one of them. And you must have heard about Amazon, Amazon store where they don't have people. It's completely automated. So there again, they actually use CCTV, uh, I mean cameras, not necessarily CCTV, but they use cameras or video footage to detect what the person is picking up and so on, right? In addition to other sensors. So that is another source, data source. And then mobile phones are ubiquitous everywhere. Everybody uses mobile phones and these mobile phones generate, a, a, not only mobile phones, but the network. Uh, they generate a lot of data on a daily basis. And of course the social media, data we have already seen that gets generated and it's available to everyone. The enterprises can pick up this information. Now, once you have all of this data, okay, so there is a question, R or Python, which one to choose for data science? A very interesting question and very difficult to answer as well. <laughs> okay, so both are used because the question is like that, which one to choose for data science? If you just say R or Python, then of course, 
I would say Python because it has much more, uh, it has applicability in data science, but also beyond. But within data science, in a way, at this point in time, R and Python are going hand in hand. But if you have to choose, I would still go for Python because of its wider applicability and also um, Python being much more popular and used for a variety of activities. Right. So um, the short answer would be uh, Python. Uh, the next question is um, which one to prefer Hadoop or Spark? OK, so this is not a uh, um, uh, so that question, you can actually use Spark along with Hadoop because Hadoop can be used for storage. HDFS is, is uh, used for storage and Spark can connect with HDFS. Um, just to clarify, um, you can use Spark with or without Hadoop. If your data is small, you can use your regular storage without Hadoop and you can run spark but if your data is large and you need a distributed cluster you can use hadoop as your backend and spark can be connected to hadoop and hadoop in case you are familiar has multiple components and hdfs is the storage component and that is also shown in my next slide i guess i will show you uh, let's see if i Okay, yeah, we'll come to that. So I'll explain that in a little bit more um, detailed manner. Uh, but just to keep it short, to, to the answer to your question is you can actually use both. Um, for storage, you, you use Hadoop, and for actually computation, you use Spark. And by the way, Spark is again uh, becoming, or it is already very popular. Um, the, the comparison for Spark is actually MapReduce. In Hadoop, you have MapReduce. So if that was the question, MapReduce or Spark, then I would say Spark. So that brings us to, that's a good question. So that brings us to our big data, right? So in the previous slide, we saw how we have all these sources of data, which can result in actually large amounts of data, as we have seen, right? So the aircraft generates terabytes of data, CCTV footage will also be terabytes, and you have ERP and other transactional systems like CRM and so on. All of these are generating large amounts of data. So we went through, or we still are kind of in a phase where we have this concept called big data. This was this is now relatively old, almost 10 years old. And the concept of big data is very easily defined or described by these three Bs, volume, velocity, and variety. Now, volume part is very easy to understand. It means that large amounts, and typically uh, at this stage, at least when we have data in the form of terabytes, we call it as big data because anything less than that can be put on one machine, right? So if you can, if you can have a hard drive of one terabyte, so potentially you can put all the data on one laptop or a desktop. So you don't need a distributed system for that. So that's our thumb rule, of course. It doesn't mean that you cannot use or do for anything, right? So that is a volume is a the size of the data but what is more important is this variety so variety is traditionally we knew data being stored in rdbms which is what we call as structured data even today of course a large amount of data is stored in rdbms which we call it as structured data in the form of rows and columns and you have tables and so on but increasingly data is being generated in unstructured format which is text you see social media data, majority of that is unstructured. Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of this is unstructured data. Text, right? Uh, then you have YouTube and others and the CCTV cameras. So these are all video data. And then you have audio data. So this is known as unstructured data. And one of the studies says that 80% of the new data is in this format, which is unstructured data. So that is the variety part of it. And then of course you have velocity. And I prefer to use just these three Bs. Of course, nowadays people add a few more like veracity and things like that. But I think these are the three fundamental Bs which were originally coined. And this is one in a way easy to explain big data. So in order to handle big data, we, we have tools like Hadoop. Because traditionally, the structured data 
was handled by RDBMS. But when it, the size goes beyond a certain, let's say a few terabytes, RDBMS can sometimes be a challenge. I wouldn't say because this can result in a big debate. I won't say that it won't be able to handle, but it can be more difficult. But then more than that, if the data is a mix of structured and unstructured data, definitely I would say RDBMS will not be able to handle and that's where we have to select to. And the velocity part is how, how fast the data is generated, that is one side of it, and how fast it is processed and the results are given, that is known as real-time processing of the data. Okay, because Hadoop was originally not designed for real time. It was batch, which means that you get all the data and then you process it at some point in time and then you get the results. And so there, there can be a lag. But velocity means that you are actually getting the data and real time you're processing and taking decisions. So that is the velocity part of it. All right, so there are a couple of questions. Looks like let me uh, take them up uh, one or two and then we will continue. How does it affect if you have working knowledge of Python and R but not SQL? How much it will affect when you are a fresher and have a gap which you used to learn R and Python? Okay, so there are actually multiple questions there. Let me pop that because I have a slide towards the end saying how to start your career in data science. So I will probably um, answer uh, this at that point in time. Um, so I will make sure I don't forget. So I will definitely answer this. Um, but if you uh, don't know SQL, I, I wouldn't say that's a big drawback, but if you know SQL, that's a big advantage. Let me put it that way. Okay. Today, in today's world, if you don't know SQL, I would say you may still be able to manage um, because if you're at, let's say, doing more of machine learning activities, somebody would have done the SQL part, extracted the data and all and given it to you. Uh, but if you know SQL as well, that will be a huge advantage. And my recommendation or suggestion is that it's a good idea to pick up SQL. Okay? And I, as I said, I have that in my last slide, but that's a quick answer to this, but you had multiple parts, I will come back to that. Okay? um yeah so there are a few more questions so let them keep coming i will uh, answer them as we move along so this is our big data part right so when when we have large amounts of data we have we use a tool um, or a platform whatever you call it the terminology is immaterial but there is something known as hadoop um the main thing is that hadoop is not a monolithic software so it is not like an exe file you install it no it has multiple components and Hadoop is um, an ecosystem. They, they, we typically call this as an ecosystem consisting of multiple parts. The key part is HDFS, which is the storage. If you remember, I mentioned that you have data from various sources coming in, and you can use HDFS to store all of this data in one place, and then you process it. Okay. And then there are supporting tools along with it. Like, for example, you have MapReduce, which is used for doing the computation. You have Scoop, which is used for moving data in and out from your traditional database systems and RDBMS. Um, then you have, uh, let's say, Hive, which is like a querying a tool. You can, just like SQL, you can use this tool to query the data and so on and so forth. I will not get into all the components because that's beyond the scope, but at least you now know there is something known as Hadoop, which is used for handling big data, and it consists of multiple components within that, and it is not a monolithic software, not one exe file. That's very important to keep it. So we use Hadoop. There are, of course, a few other tools to handle unstructured and large amounts of data, but Hadoop is by far the most popular one. And of course, there are um, in a detailed session of Hadoop, I would have talked about, you know, there is open source, there is paid versions and uh, distributions and so on. But for now, probably that is out of scope, so I'll leave it. So you have Hadoop, you have, you use Hadoop to basically bring up, bring together um, data from various sources and store it. And then you, you can uh, pretty much uh, analyze this data and, and uh, you know, process this data and prepare the data to do other activities like in the previous slide we have seen, let's say you want to do your ML or deep learning and things like that. So that actually brings us to the next part or next topic, which is adoption of AI. 
So now you have the data, you, you would have done all the exploratory data analysis using the various tools. And, and now the data is in a way prepared to perform a, a little higher level, I would say, stuff like machine learning and deep learning and, and also maybe create an AI. Um, so at this point, uh, let me take up uh, one more question. Uh, what is the best combination of languages for a beginner in data science? So as I said, um, if you can, if you're looking at one programming language as a beginner to start with, my suggestion is Python. But since you said combination, I'm assuming you're planning to learn more languages. It would be R and Python. Um, and also, let me put it uh, a little bit in a, in a more detailed way. Today, there is still a lot of demand in the market for R because a lot of work is still happening in R. But the future is Python because a lot of um, stuff is or can be, which is being done today in R, can also now be done in Python. So this, this is a transition phase. At this point, I would say there is an equal demand for Python and R. Uh, but if you're looking at the future, obviously, I, my suggestion would be Python. OK, um, so I hope that answers that question. Uh, there is uh, looks like uh, a couple of more questions. Let me take one more at least. How to get skilled in data science and data cleaning? For example, selection of significant variables. Oh, OK, so. Uh, that's a little bit more detail. So I'll, I'll talk about that maybe in the, the later part um, and uh, you know how exactly to get started and, and so on. Um, there is one more question apart from software, how statistics and probability play in data science? Very important question. I think very important question. Um, so th there are different schools of thought here. Um, some people are of the opinion that if you want to work in the area of data science, you need to have um, you know very strong mathematical background, statistical background. Uh, and in fact, a few um, companies when they are selecting people, um, they they also even put a criteria that you have to be a PhD. Maybe some of them they even say you have to be a PhD. Some say you have to be an engineer or some say you have to have a statistical background, uh, I mean, statistical degree rather. Um, so I have a, a slightly different opinion and this may not go with the uh, majority opinion. Majority of the people feel that you need to have a statistical background without that you can. In my opinion, you can learn all of this. Of course, you need to have some basic knowledge and that means that you would have, you should have done a mathematics, some basic mathematics in your class 10 or plus two. I'm assuming most of the people will be of that. But I don't believe that you need to be a, a statistical biz or, uh, or a mathematical biz kid to be in, the, in this industry. Um, so that, in my opinion, is a myth. Of course, as I said, there are a variety of roles in, in this industry, in the data science industry. Um, everybody doesn't have to be a mathematical biscuit. Some of the topics, some of the areas um, will help if you have, like for example, if you are trying to develop an algorithm, right? A machine learning algorithm completely of your own, definitely you need a, a very strong mathematical background, a statistical background. But a lot of work that we do in the industry is not in that area. How many people are actually, at least in India, developing an algorithm from scratch, even globally? Because there is already a lot of work already done in this area. The algorithms are already available. What is the, the, the need of the R is to apply all of these and build applications that solve problems of the society. That is the need. And for that, yes, you need some good, uh, you know, you need to have an aptitude for programming. You need to have an aptitude for data that is definitely there, that is required. Not everybody has that. But beyond that, I believe you don't need to be um, a whisked, a statistics whisked, or a mathematics whisked to do um, some of these activities or many of these activities, I would say. Okay, um, 
and when i when i said there are different roles uh, right so um, you can based on your um, you know your um, aptitude and your ability you can choose a, a, a particular role because as i said data science and data scientist role is a is a very wide um, area uh, and therefore you can actually make yourself choose a particular area and that again is there in my last slide um, if, if you're really fantastic in statistics and mathematics you're a whiz kid of course you can choose a role that because there is a requirement for such roles as well um, and you can choose a role accordingly where you're doing more into research and uh, developing new algorithms and so on um, on the other hand, if you are strong in programming, you can choose a role which is more into applying these algorithms. Uh, they, are, they are available in the form of APIs and developing applications that solve the problems of the society. Um, or if you are really very strong in, um, in databases and SQL, you can you are a good uh, Wizard at uh, SQL, you can uh, you know work in the area of data preparation and uh, data extraction and all this, right? So there, and, and yeah, there is also a very very important role of data visualization, okay, which needs a little bit more of creativity and uh, of course you will also need a bit of skills on uh, extracting the data, which means querying and so on. But also, how do you put you know the maximum information in a minimum area because you have the the screen the real estate on the screen is very limited but how do you translate all those insights and put it on one that little dashboard so that the ceo or the cio who is taking a look at it can take very quick decisions that's an art more than science right so all kinds of Trends are required. So the, the short answer, I know it was a very long answer, but the thing is, it, it, it helps, no doubt, if you have statistics and probability, if you're strong in it, it definitely helps. But that doesn't become a handicap. If you're not uh, very strong at it, it, you can always learn. And many of the courses, by the way, that are available, the training courses, data science training courses, they actually teach some of the stuff um as well as a part of the as a part of the training so if you have reasonable aptitude i think people can pick up to the extent that is required to perform your job you know, again you cannot become a um uh, you know statistic whiz kid through these training programs but the, to the extent that is required you can pick it up okay all right um so now coming to the other interesting part which is Artificial intelligence. This is the new buzzword. All of you would have heard about it. AI, artificial intelligence. And this is the Wikipedia definition. AI is an intelligence exhibited by machines, whereby you train your machines. So therefore, AI includes uh, machine learning and deep learning and so on. So I'll just tell you what exactly is the difference between these. Um, for all you know, and for all the buzz, which has which has started maybe over the last couple of years or three years, four years, AI is actually not very new. The term AI or artificial intelligence was coined way back in 1956 by John McCarthy. So it is not exactly new, but at that point in time, they were not able to take it forward. They did some research, but they couldn't take it forward because it needed obviously the kind of computational power that was needed. Uh, was not available and therefore now in the late 90s with the availability of deep and powerful hardware the availability of cloud which is uh, you know which which makes um, the elastic utilization possible because there are certain times in when you're developing ai or when you're doing machine learning you need uh, the the computing power in spurts so when you are training the model, you need a lot of computation power, but then that's it. After that, when you are actually doing inference, and I know these are some of the terms maybe new to you, I will tell you probably as we move along. But um, once the training of the model is done, you don't need so much computation power, so which means that cloud is a perfect um, you know, place to do some of this stuff where when you need all that computation power, you spin the instances that you need, and once it is done, you shut down so your cost is controlled rather than buying the entire hardware 
Okay, so that is AI. AI is classified into three types. What is known as artificial narrow intelligence. And the ultimate goal is artificial super intelligence. So we are today at artificial narrow intelligence, whatever we are doing today, in, you know, um, in spite of all the hype and um, uh, the, the uh, noise around AI, we are actually uh, just we are just about scratching the surface. We are we have not gone very far. But what is possible is the ultimate goal or the holy grail is artificial super intelligence. Now, the definition. What is the definition of artificial narrow intelligence? This can probably be we need not go into all the details. But basically, it says that it is it is one system which can perform one activity much better than a human being. So it could be like a, a system playing a game. It can it can beat a human being. So it is better than a human being. But then that's about it. It can do only that. It cannot do multiple things. So on the other hand, the other extreme is artificial super intelligence, whereby the system can perform multiple activities. And it, in all of these, it can do better than human beings. But we are far away from that. It would take at least a couple of decades, if not more, to reach that. So there is an intermediate stage known as artificial general intelligence, whereby the systems can perform multiple activities, but only in some of them, they may be better than human beings, but not all. Right. So that's a, a broad classification of AI. And today, of all the uh, applications fall in this artificial narrow intelligence uh, category. And what are the other topics that come under AI? This is just uh, this is not cast in stone, but just a quick summarize, summarization, if you will. You must have heard of some of these terms and topics. So this is what comes under AI. And also, this may not be very exhaustive. So you have, on the one hand, machine learning. You have uh, part of the machine learning is also deep learning. You have speech recognition, computer vision, robotics. So all these come under AI. So this is like a very broad umbrella. It may be some a few more topics which I would have missed out, but broadly, this is what uh, is uh, uh, coming under AI. Okay, and this is another view of AI. So AI is like the overarching topic. And you must have heard about machine learning and deep learning. We typically use these terms together. We say AI and ML or AI and DL, right? So the idea is AI is like an overarching topic and the technique that is used or the technology that is used is machine learning. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Now, this may be contrary to intuition. Our intuition might say that oh, deep learning is a larger thing, but actually deep learning is a subset of machine learning because the machine learning principles, the fundamentals are all the same that we use in deep learning as well. We do classification, we do regression. That's all same in deep learning. The primary difference is that deep learning uses a lot of unstructured or primarily unstructured data like video and images and, and text and so on. And it uses neural networks. So neural networks or NN is used in deep learning. So that is the primary difference between traditional, we call it as traditional machine learning, which is used in with uh, structured data. And when we use by and large, uh, unstructured data like images and so on, then it began with that we use neural network. The data is unstructured and if we use neural network as our algorithm or technique, then we call it as deep learning. So that's the reason deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So I hope now it is clear the relation between AI, DL and ML. This is a very common question. What's the, what's the relation or what's the difference between AI, ML and DL? So this is the relation. Okay, now machine learning in turn is classified broadly into two types. One is supervised and another is unsupervised. And machine learning is a process whereby you teach a machine using some existing or historical data as we that is what we call it as training set. Now the training set 
sometimes has what is known as a label and in some cases if there is no label and again this is a little bit more technical term in, 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 and probably out of scope for this but it, 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 one thing is important to understand is that even in unsupervised learning there is data so very often people say that if there is no data historical data then it is unsupervised no unsupervised also has data it, it also learns from data existing historical data but the difference is that this is labeled data in supervised learning there is something known as a label using which the system learns and in unsupervised learning it has to learn without any labels that are available so there are these are primarily broadly two different types there are a few others like um, uh, in addition to uh, these two but for now we will stick to these two because we are at a basic level okay supervised learning unsupervised learning and there are certain techniques here so supervised learning has what is known as classification and um, uh, regression and unsupervised has clustering and uh, and of course there is a third type called reinforcement learning i just avoided here not to confuse you with too many things but to start with if you are aware of these two i think that's a good start supervised learning unsupervised learning okay all right and then we have when we want to perform these activities when we do this learning using a neural network then it becomes deep learning and this is a, a view of a neural network this is a visualization of a neural network and again a, a more detailed uh, you know version of neural network is probably not possible now but just to a very quick idea you, you will get so the, the, the neural networks is um, uh, modeled around our human brain and that's why it's called neural network because human brain has what is known as the neurons there are billions of neurons in the human brain so we try to create a mathematical model of the of a neuron that is known as a perceptron and we assemble these perceptrons or these artificial neurons together to simulate the brain of course we cannot go to the extent of billions of them but we can definitely go into hundreds or thousands of them and they are arranged in what is known as layers so this is known as a deep neural network which has multiple layers and every neural network has at least three layers what is known as an input layer an output layer and at least one hidden layer so that is known as a um, a shallow neural network and anything more than one hidden layer we call it as a deep neural network okay so that's a, a quick idea about neural network so these are nothing but these are not nothing physical this is just a representation each of these nodes is a representation of a neuron but it is actually mathematically this is a function okay so we this is a there is a mathematical implementation or a, or a, you can also call it as a, a piece of python code right so that is what is this is the representation of that so that is neural network so we use neural networks and for doing deep learning and ai basically we use neural network now what are some of the examples or applications of ai so I would like to start by asking a question. Does anyone know who this is or what this is? I'm sure many of you have seen this or heard about this because it is not very, not new news. This is already two years, almost two years old or one and a half years old. Any responses? Okay, I, I probably don't see the response directly, but Pradeep, if you can put it in the chat. Um, I'm assuming some of you have answered it. Okay. All right. So this is okay. Very good. So it is basically Sophia. Okay. So in November 2017, Saudi Arabia gave a citizenship to this robot. And at that point in time, and by, as you can see, this robot is in the female form, right? And actually, at that point in time, uh, women were not allowed to even drive in Saudi Arabia. Now, of course, they passed a rule and now they can drive. I think last year they passed a rule. But at that point in time, they were not even allowed to drive. So that's a significant thing because that shows that even a country like Saudi Arabia recognizes the power of AI. 
of course there is giving a citizenship to a robot doesn't really mean much but it is more symbolic to show that they understand the significance of ai and then you must have also heard about ibm's watson and if you some of you have followed this ibm watson defeated a human champion in a game show called um jeopardy right it's a tv show called jeopardy but since then ibm has gone ahead and converted this into or, or modified this for various industries including healthcare and a, a lot of hospitals uh, are in the uh, or in the healthcare industry watson is kind of being used for predicting like cancer lung cancer and so on and so forth so this is another application of ai and a few more i think these are common place everybody all of you must be knowing this chatbots i'm sure all of you are familiar with chatbots every website today any website you visit you will be greeted by a chatbot anyone knows what this is yeah alexa very good and how about this one now very often when i ask people they say this is a tesla car right no it is not i know there is a mind share for tesla but this is actually a google's self driving car so these are some of the applications which are already available in a way and some of them in already in production some of them still some research is going on so how does this self driving car work let me just show you a quick video which will basically help you a little bit understand how the training of the self driving car is done okay? and then we will come back as i said i promised a few videos right so that it doesn't get boring so let me just show you this and then we will come back Got it. All right. So that's how a self-driving car is trained. That is uh, what we have seen as uh, how the car is trained, a self-driving car. And then we have, I'm sure you all recognize probably this. This is a robot, and this is actually a multi-terrain robot. Uh, the company is uh, in Boston Dynamics, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, they have developed this but there are a, a variety of such robots and um, which are being used in or will soon be actually launched in production very soon i think in a, within a month or so they have some robots but they have they've been testing it i'm sorry okay um, yeah i'm back on to the ppt but uh, i want to share uh, one more video very very shortly so um Okay, so this one I was talking about. So this is a multi-terrain robot developed by Boston Dynamics, 
and um, in fact there are uh, a different type of robots similar to these okay which can be used in the industry this was originally designed for or developed for the for the defense but for some reason um, the american uh, or us defense uh, did not want to use this um, but then, then based on this they developed some industrial robots so let's take a look at i'm, I'm sure probably some of you have seen this this video has also gone viral so let me just show you that and then we will come back Okay, how cool is that? Now, these robots were so far still in the lab, but uh, Boston Dynamics has recently, I think last week or just the beginning of this week, I, I saw the news that they are actually going to make them available uh, for sale. Um, I know my slides are probably not visible. Yeah, I think now they're visible. Um, so that is another interesting um, area where Robots are being used, and again, robots were used earlier also, but those were uh, not AI enabled. Um, they were more pre programmed to do just one or two activities, but these are mobile, they can move around, they can see. Um, so they, they, that's why these are AI enabled. Training them is much easier. Uh, it's not writing any program or anything like that. So this is another huge area where, um, which will impact the manufacturing sector and many other areas. And I'm sure all of you recognize this. So what is this? This is a drone. And again, there were applications of drones recently in the news. Um, I think um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of the food delivery companies just yesterday has done a, a trial run in Gurgaon and they delivered uh, for their first food package using a drone. Of course, this was done on an experimental basis. And this is in India, by the way. Right, and there was another two days or three days back. Um, I think blood was uh, transferred or blood, blood was blood uh, packet was um, uh, you know sent from a, uh, either from a health uh, care unit to another health care unit or something like that using a drone. So even in India, we are starting to see the use of this, and very soon they will become. Um, much more common but i want to show you one more video which is really very interesting this is um, as you can imagine amazon amazon is planning to launch drone deliveries and this is more this is more in the us and they when they did this first experiment they recorded this so there's a live footage of that let's just take a look at it because retail is an industry which is adopting um, ai like anything right so let's just run this is pretty much my last one and then we will move forward amazon is developing a service to use drones to safely deliver packages to customers in 30 minutes or less it's called prime air we've started a new private trial for customers in the cambridge area of england and on december 7th we completed our first delivery Customers will choose from a selection of thousands of items tucked away in a prime era fulfillment center located just over the horizon from their homes. We have been operating fulfillment centers for quite a while now, but this one is unlike all the rest. These modest looking buildings contain innovative prime air technology. Here's how it works. Moments after receiving the order, an electrically powered Amazon drone makes its way down an automated track and then rises into the sky with the customer's package on board. These drones are autonomous. From takeoff to landing and return, they operate completely on their own. Cruising quietly below 400 feet, carrying packages up to five pounds, and guided by GPS, our systems are designed to find their destinations safely.
Within 30 minutes of placing the order, the customer receives their package. For this initial trial, customers can choose from the latest tech gadgets to their dog's favorite biscuits. We will use the data gathered during this beta test and the feedback provided by customers to expand the private trial to more customers over time. We're starting with two customers now, and in the coming months, we'll offer participation to dozens of customers living within several miles of our UK facility, and then growing to hundreds more. After that, well, it'd be easy to say, the sky's the limit. But that's not exactly true anymore, is it? All right, so that is another uh, use or application of uh, AI. Moving on, I think these are, as I mentioned, a lot of industries which are adopting AI in different ways. Manufacturing is definitely using robotics or robots. Then we have automotive, we talked about the self-driving car. And um, since we don't have time, otherwise I would have tried to explain a little bit how this whole thing works, but in the interest of time, we will, <laughs> yeah. So it did not uh, miss much. So I was talking about the industry. So manufacturing industry, this was the slide I was talking about, which is basically how uh, robots are being used. Then we have automotive. And we have already seen how self-driving cars are trained and we are already aware, but, uh, and then what I was saying was, uh, if I had time, I'd explain how this works, but in the interest of time, we will move on. Healthcare is another huge area, and we already saw how Watson is being used, and there are multiple other um, applications or um, AI solutions which uh, help in predicting some of the diseases like cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, or Alzheimer's, and even blindness. Um, so what, what is one of the, you know, what is the reason for this? Um, a, a disease like cancer, for example, is, is curable if it is detected early on. A lot of the, the, lot of the, um, of the deaths uh, occur because it is too late by the time they detect the cancer and therefore um, there is no possibility to treat. But if it is detected early on, and that's where we are hoping or the industry is hoping that AI will be of help because if you have AI solutions, you can actually screen people, whether they have any symptoms or not, you can do large scale screening and predict that um, the onset of some of these diseases and thereby you can actually um, cure and prevent deaths. Okay? So that's the area in healthcare where uh, there is a lot of promise where AI can be used. Retail, we have already seen a video of how retail, one of the examples, um, but um, you know that is the, the, in the delivery area, but there are a lot of other areas like in supply chain, demand forecasting, uh, your warehouse management, and I'm sure some of you have already seen some videos around how um, the stores of Alibaba or even Amazon, these robots are running around, moving around, um, moving these the carts of uh, the, the warehouse uh, products, right? So that, that's uh, another area. So there is a huge adoption in, in retail and again, if we had time, I would have shown you this uh, Amazon Go store, but you can search on YouTube. It is available. Look for Amazon Go. Uh, so that's a store where everything is automated. There are no store agents or what do you call? Yeah, I think uh, there's no human beings there uh, helping you with uh, even the checkout and things like that. Everything is automated. So that's the future. You can take a look at that uh, on YouTube. Uh, so those are some of the ways in which various industries are adopting. And um, now pretty much on the last part um, of how to begin a career in data science. And I think this comes back to some of the questions uh, some of you had, <coughs> um, <laughs> excuse me, in terms of what you should learn and uh, you know whether you should learn SQL or Python and so on and so forth. So I think hopefully some of those questions will be answered here and uh, if there are any more just keep, let them keep coming and um, if i'm not able to answer you can also send it to us by email 
um, the first thing is you need to actually get yourself familiar and comfortable with handling data. Now, if you can, one of the ways, of course, is RDBMS and SQL. Um, I know somebody said I'm not familiar uh, with uh, SQL, which is okay, but it is not very hard to learn. And if you can get yourself familiarized with this, because remember, a large part of the data is still stored in RDBMS. And we try to bring that into our, uh, you know, unstructured format or put it into HDFS and so on. But a lot of the traditional data is in RDBMS. So it makes life much easier if you are familiar with, because even if you're using, let's say Hadoop, you, when you're using uh, Hive, you need to query the data, which is uh, basically, um, uh, you know, which is like query, which is like SQL, right? So that it makes sense for, for you to, if you're, let's say trying to come into a data science uh, career moving into data science career or make a career in data science it's a good idea i wouldn't say you cannot do without this but it's a good idea to learn rdbms sql a little bit so that you should be familiar with at least some basic query um if you're not familiar with any programming language it's a good idea to start with python and even if you're familiar let's say you know java or some of the language you will have a head start but i would say learn python if not uh, r at least python it's easy to learn if somebody if you know java programming it's even better and much much easier but even if you don't know any programming language python is easy to learn so it is it was earlier taught in schools to, to kids so it is not that difficult my suggestion is start learning python programming uh, and then there are as i said data science is a huge area uh, so you, everyone cannot be an expert in everything so based on your aptitude, your interest, your ability, you try to focus or choose at a particular area, a niche for yourself within data science. So there are some people who, who love large amounts of data and uh, you know working with uh, distributed uh, um, systems and so on. Um, so you can then, those people can look for uh, Hadoop and Spark where you can handle large amounts of data. Uh, a few people are more uh, into visualization and more creative and they, they love, um, you know, creating uh, dashboards rather than uh, programming and things like that. Uh, so in that case, you can focus on data visualization and it uses tools like Tableau and ClickView. Um, there are some versions of, uh, let's say Tableau is available for one month free. You can try to download and play around with that. Um, and things like that. So you you can kind of familiarize yourself with uh, some of these tools if you want to um, get into visualization. Um, then you there are other areas like machine learning and deep learning. Obviously, here you need quite a bit of programming, uh, Python programming, especially uh, machine learning. Of course, you can also do with R, but Python is now, as I said, uh, very uh, widely accepted. So my suggestion is to learn Python and and use this, uh, these libraries like scikit-learn, um, and uh, you know you can uh, pick up machine learning um, if you are interested in that. Um, then you have a deep learning if you if that needs a little bit more in terms of understanding, uh, let's say neural networks and so on. Um, and it uses uh, this library called TensorFlow, which is an open source. Um, then you should be you can actually do that as well, right? So. Th those are the areas. Now, how do you get started? Uh, the, I, I know we are overshooting a few minutes, but I hope you'll be able to bear with me. Um, so the, the first thing is to, you can do uh, self-learning, right? So you don't have to spend anything. You go on to YouTube. There is a lot of free content available. And test the waters. Are you able to pick this up, some of these uh, skills? Okay? Because there, there may be a possibility that probably you don't like this, right? So test this out, try to learn yourself doing self-learning. There are a lot of uh, um, free courses or uh, sessions available. You can check it out. And then it may be a good idea to go for a formal training program uh, because that will be more structured and based on whether you want to spend full time, you can go for a classroom based or there are also a lot of online uh, courses available. Uh, whereby you know they take you through a proper structured uh, manner and even if you don't have any programming language they will teach you the programming language like python um, they will provide you with the basic statistical knowledge and so on right so that is more a structure so once you gain a little bit of that experience the training and so on 
um, try to participate in all if some of you are already familiar with that then uh, my recommendation is join this website called Kaggle um, and they are uh, actually it is free and they offer a lot of competitions for you to join and play around uh, and, and uh, write your own code or do this machine learning and deep learning um, then if some of you are let's say freshers out of college take up some internship don't worry whether it is paid not paid there is huge demand for interns uh, in the data science area uh, apply and uh, there is um, there are there are various websites i think intern shala is one of them or there are a few others uh, take up an internship i think that's the best way it is like being in the in the environment of data science and you will get to learn a lot okay so with that i would like to um, end my session uh, but if you have any more please uh, send out an email to contact at manipalprolearn.com and we'll be more than happy to get back to you uh, and answer your questions or set up a call with our expert. Um, so uh, with that, I would like to conclude our session and uh, Pradeep, uh, back to you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Hey, thanks for watching. Do like the video, share it, and also don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more such videos. Check out exclusive coupon codes for our YouTube learners in the description and visit manipalproland.com to redeem it.